Good morning. Hi, everybody. So, um, we're starting Exodus 16, and I don't know how far we'll get. Um, I'm hopeful we'll get to some of the good stuff. I haven't read ahead, but let's take a look and see what we have here. Oh, man, I've got a lot of writing in my... Um, I guess I'll just have to start reading and we'll find out what happens. Uh, Exodus chapter 16. Oh, and I'll even say it first. Hi. Say hi if you hop on. It's always good to hear from you guys, to know you're there. And they journeyed from Elim, and all the congregation of children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. So it's a small thing, but I mean, Sin, wilderness of Sin, uh, there's, a, there's an irony to that name, but it's not tying into the sin when we think of sin. You know, it's not the same word, but I mean, you know, there's definitely a, an irony there. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, and when we ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. C.H. Huh. Macintosh. Uh, his book's over there. I don't think you can see it. It's off camera. But really good book. His notes on the Pentateuch. Um, <clears throat> it's an old book. Uh, I want to say the it's recommended. It's like D.L. Moody and H.A. Ironside. Like these are the guys writing on the book. You know, you always have people promote the book. They're the ones promoting the book. So when you got Moody and Ironside saying your book is good, it's probably pretty good. But he just it's it's simple, right? But Egypt was behind them, Canaan was before them, and the sea sand of the desert was around them. I mean, they're just I, I don't know if you, you get surrounded by the craziness of this life and just everything that's going on. And I mean, you've got the stuff you just got out of, you've got the place you're supposed to be headed, but everywhere you look around you is just sand. And it's just, it can be discouraging. And it's, it's been said, it, it only took 40 hours to get the Jews out of Egypt, but it took 40 years to get Egypt out of the Jews. And, and that's kind of the idea is that they're delivered, but there's part of them that just wants to go back. And as we move through the book of Exodus and really through the rest of the Pentateuch, the rest of the books of Moses, the Torah, the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they're all looking forward to the book of Joshua because God's intent had always been the promised land. God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the promised land. And yet he had a plan, though, because the land wasn't ready. He was giving those people a little more time because their iniquity wasn't full, God tells them. It's like, hey, they're wicked, but I'm still barren with them. But eventually they're going to be so wicked, we'll kick them out. And so 430 years after the promise, we see the Israelites freed from Egypt. God promises it to Abraham, and 430 years later, his kids finally now get to go to receive this promise. And we're told by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 uh, that the types, we talked about types yesterday, that going through the Red Sea two chapters ago um, is a picture of baptism. And so look at these pictures now, these types. This is symbolic. And as Paul wrote to the Romans and 1 Corinthians 10, you know, that these are our examples. The book of Hebrews, I was going over with my children because we we're in the book of Numbers in our morning breakfast time. And, and with my children, I was going over yesterday. Look at the complaining. First, we see uh, Aaron and, and Miriam complaining. Then we see the rebellion of Korah and the complaining. And, and we looked at Hebrews together and it's just like, don't harden your hearts as in the day of the rebellion. 
And there's a lesson for us here where these people are freed from Egypt. The Passover lamb protected them from death. They were set free from bondage. And yet now we find ourselves not in the promised land, not in the land of milk and honey, not where God wants you. Free but complaining. And I'll tell you what, if there's a sin that God takes seriously, it's complaining. That's the whole thing here. The people complained in verse two we just read. And it's funny, but let me just say something I'm I'm pretty serious about, and not that I'm not the most guilty of all at the same time. But today, people don't treat complaining like a wicked and evil sin. But that's what the Bible calls it. Complaining, whining, oh, well, this and that. It really just shows the heart. See, out of the heart and out of the mouth proceeds, right? What's going on in here? And that's why, you know, Philippians 2.14, do all things, not just church things, not just this things and those things, but do all things without complaining and disputing. Quit arguing. Quit complaining. And so the children of Israel, it's going to take 40 years to get Egypt out of the Israelites. That's the idea, is that there's this season in the wilderness of sin. Again, quite the coincidental name where people are free, but they're not what they're supposed to be. They are free, but they're not where God intends them to be. And I don't want to be there. That's not what I want my testimony to be. And you know what? A whole generation is going to die in the wilderness. Literally over a million people, closer to two million, are going to die free complainers. And as you look around the church these days, I wonder how many of those we have. (laughs) I mean, you have to assume, right? The average church is going to have some spirit-filled Christians. That's really what the promised land is a picture of. The land flowing of milk and honey, being in the center of where God has called you to be. There's going to be some of those. But there's also going to be, I don't know how many, maybe it depends on the church, but they're free. But they're whiners and complainers. They're grumblers. They're not doing what God says to do. But praise the Lord, they are free. And as we know, not pictured here in this type, but there's also those who are the false converts. They look like they're free, but they're not. These are the ones Jesus will say, depart, I never knew you. And obviously there's even those in the church, uh, maybe not regularly, but you know, they're drug there. (laughs) They're not free and they know they're not free and, you know, but someone who loves them drug them to church. And so, hey, you got to get them there somehow. And so these guys are there and they're complaining. Why can't we, we want the bread? We want the this. And you know what? It is not a surprising thing that you find yourself longing for the things of Egypt. Especially when all you see is sand all around, sand in your sandals, sand in your clothes, sand in your underwear. Yep, that's not fun. That's irritating. And you know what irritating does? It makes me want to complain. And when I'm irritated, I even want to go back to Egypt. You know, I mean, uh, I can throw out scenarios. Maybe they're not my scenarios, and maybe they're not yours, but they're someone's. 
when the irritations add up, nothing sounds better than a drink. When the irritations add up, nothing sounds better than a high. When the irritations add up, my flesh cries out. I just want to satisfy my flesh. And I can satisfy it with numbing drugs, or I can satisfy it with sex, or I can satisfy it with this or that. To be honest, it's not like the same as drugs and sex, but it's like, I know I'm guilty of, of emotional eating. <laughs> and I exercise a lot and whatnot. You know, you might not notice, well, maybe you do notice, but it is, it's like you get upset and you want to satisfy your flesh. And so since I'm a pastor, it's like, well, I can't do this and I can't do that, but I can do ice cream <laughs> and I can do cookies or whatever it may be. But that's just, it shows. It's part of our nature that when, when we're irritated, our flesh cries out for Egypt and our flesh just wants to be satisfied. So here's these guys, they're in the wilderness and just, oh, give me some meat. I want some bread. I want all this stuff. Verse four, though, says, the Lord said to Moses, behold, I'll rain bread from heaven on you and the people shall go out and gather a certain quarter every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. Now we're going to get in, I guess, tomorrow to manna. And it's a beautiful picture. And you just need to be here tomorrow to hear it because it's really good. But the catch with the manna, it's this filling of the Holy Spirit. It is, it is God's power and presence that you seek daily in your life. But he says, I'm going to test them if they'll walk in obedience. And if they walk in obedience, this is what they'll experience. And if they don't walk in obedience, well, they're going to die as complainers in the wilderness. And so every day we have the option to obey. Every day we have the option to heed God's warnings. Every day we have the option to walk in the Spirit or to be a complainer, to trust God's promises or to just satisfy our flesh when times get tough. And so... <clears throat> Every believer, to some extent, has a wilderness experience where you come out of Egypt, you're in the wilderness, and then quite often, I'd say more often than not, it's, it's actually, we see it in the book of Acts, but it's rarer in the Bible to see people being baptized with the Holy Spirit at the same time as conversion. That would be like crossing the Red Sea and then all of a sudden you're crossing the Jordan River back to back or at the same time even. The Jordan is a second baptism, is it not? The waters will part again and they'll walk across again on dry land. There's a, again, the pictures are never ending. But just know that God says here, I'm going to test them whether they'll walk in my law or not. It's funny because the law, the Commandments haven't been given yet, right? There is no 10 commandments. There is no additional commandments. Here he's just using that word Torah in the general sense. That will they walk in what I've taught? Will they walk in my teachings? When I explain and show them things, will they obey or will they not? And so just know you've got an Egyptian rebel living inside of you. And it's going to cry out for things that you know aren't good for you. And day by day, every day, God provides you with the opportunity and the test. All right, it's a new day. Will she walk the way she knows she ought to? Will she do the very thing that she knows always comes through? Or will she skip it and just go on about her day? Wondering why God's presence seems to be lacking. Wondering why. Why don't why am I so in my flesh today? Isn't it silly to skip out on devotions 
and then wonder why you feel so far from God at times? Yeah. We are interesting people, aren't we? <laughs> as stubborn as they come. So tomorrow we get to really dive deep on manna, and it's it's good. It's good stuff. So I hope you make it out bright and early. Set the alarm clock. I'm hopping on right at 645 or as close as I can. So you can set an alarm or there's somewhere around here you can hit a button and then they're like you'll get a notification on Facebook when I go live. But all right, you guys take care. Have a great day. And I will see you guys bright and early tomorrow morning. Cheers. <laughs>